Our electric drill with a 5 16 inch bit is used to drill two holes through each control arm. Four 5 16 inch diameter by one and a quarter inch long bolts with flat washers, lock washers, and nuts are used to secure our new shock mounts to each lower control arm. The bolts are securely fastened with the appropriate tools. In most cases, we find it necessary to slightly trim the lower front shock mount bushing to fit our new front shock mounts. We simply take the measurement between the lower plates of the front shock mount and transfer this to our new shocks. After marking the shocks with a china marker and securing them properly in a bench vise, we trim each side an equal amount using our hacksaw. Once our shock absorbers have been trimmed, they bolt easily to our new chassis. The lower shock mount bushing is secured to the shock mount with a 3 8 inch diameter by 2 and a half inch long bolt with a flat washer, lock washer, and nut. It is then securely tightened. We then repeat the procedure on the other side. At this point, we should mention we may have to modify or replace the front springs. Generally, it is necessary to remove one full coil from each spring. However, because Chevrolet utilized a number of springs and various chevettes, we prefer to wait until we have finished the car before making any modification. Since additional weight will be placed on the chassis later, proper ride height is difficult to determine right now. Depending upon the amount of wear, it may be unnecessary for us to alter the front springs. Once the lower mount has been secured, we extend the top of the shock and use the new hardware supplied with each shock to secure it to the upper mounting bracket. The new radiator support bracket that came with our replicar assembly is placed on the front frame cross piece. We position the bracket, making certain that the side with the spacer washer closest to the upright goes on the driver's side of the car. We measure three quarters of an inch from the upright on the passenger's side and mark all hole locations with a china marker. Our electric drill with a three eighths of an inch bit is used to drill the four holes. Next, we secure the bracket to the chassis at the holes without spacers using five sixteenths of an inch diameter by one and three quarter inch long bolts with flat washers, lock washers, and nuts. We then position the lower supports that were removed from our chevette on top of the spacer on each side. We have drilled 3 8 inch holes, 1 inch to the driver's side of each chevette bracket to relocate them slightly. We secure the chevette brackets to the chassis with 5 16 inch diameter by 2 inch long bolts with flat washers, lock washers, and nuts. The appropriate tools are used to tighten the bracket, securing it to the frame. Now that we've installed the bracket, we can mount our radiator. Carefully, we place it in position on the lower support brackets. At times, we find chevette radiators that require slight modifications. Sometimes the original may have been replaced in our donor car. Once the radiator has been positioned properly, we place the upper shroud in place and mark the hole locations on the top of the bracket. After drilling the correct holes, we secure the shroud with 5 16 by 3 quarter inch self-tapping hex head screws. Our new hoses can now be attached. We modify and attach the transmission cooler lines as outlined in the instruction manual. Let's take a minute and review the exhaust system. In most cases, we find that the only usable parts of the Chevette exhaust system are the front header pipe and the catalytic converter, along with its mounting bracket. When this is the case, we can either have a muffler shop finish the job, or we can make the pieces ourselves. In any event, we cannot use the original muffler. The original Chevette drive shaft is too long to fit into our new chassis. Shortening the unit is best left to a professional. Checking our yellow pages, we locate a shop that can handle the job. Before we send the unit out, we must determine the correct measurements. We insert the drive shaft yoke onto the transmission shaft, pushing it forward, allowing approximately one or two inches of play before the yoke bottoms out against the transmission. Using a tape measure, we find the distance between the center of the front universal and the center of the bearing mount recess on the rear companion flange of the axle extension. Taking the drive shaft to the shop we've located, we give them this measurement. We also have our drive shaft balanced and the universal joints check thoroughly.
With our drive shaft in hand, all that's necessary for installation is to slip the splined yoke onto the transmission shaft, then push forward on the drive shaft and slide the rear universal cups into the recessed areas on the companion flange of the rear axle extension. Once this has been done, we use the original straps and bolts and along with the appropriate wrench, we secure the drive shaft to the rear axle extension. Our exhaust system can now be installed. First, we bolt the bracket on the catalytic converter to the transmission bracket. Next, we move to the engine compartment, where we attach the flange of the front header pipe to the exhaust manifold with the original Chevette hardware. Our new muffler, along with the tailpipe, are fit and trimmed as required. It is important that we make certain the appropriate hangers are utilized to suspend our new exhaust system from our chassis. We do not want the system to come into contact with any part of the frame or suspension. The exhaust pipe is secured to the muffler with appropriate clamps. If we choose, we can have the pipes welded. Following the details in the instruction manual, we fabricate a battery box for our replicar chassis. As an alternative, a high-gloss black gel coat fiberglass unit is available from the factory, allowing clearance for mounting a heater as well as an air conditioning unit. A bracket to support the computer is fabricated from scrap steel and holds the computer below the recessed area where the battery is mounted. We secure this bracket to the rear of the battery box against the rear wall of the battery recess. After we have fabricated our battery box and mounted the Chevette computer, we apply Window Weld, a 3M product available at most auto supply stores or automotive paint stores. We apply it to the front and rear frame cross pieces that come into contact with the battery box. This is done to seal the engine, thus preventing fumes from entering the passenger compartment. If we wished, we could use rubber weather stripping or a good quality silicone sealer. If we choose, this would be a good time to install the optional compact heater available from the factory. We would follow the instructions in the manual and those supplied with the heater to bolt the unit to the upper right corner of the firewall. All hose connections with the engine would then be made. As we must do some preliminary work prior to installation, here we show two floor liners for comparison. Following the details found in the instruction manual, we use a china marker and first mark the area for the emergency brake housing. A saber saw is used to cut out the area. The shift lever area is then drilled and cut. The rear corners and sides are marked and trimmed, along with the front corners and forward lip that comes into contact with the firewall. A hole is cut to the left center of the transmission tunnel for the speedometer cable. We wear safety glasses and gloves during this procedure. The emergency brake lever is positioned against the side of the fiberglass support housing that comes with the replicar kit. A china marker is used to mark the mounting hole locations and the hole for the emergency brake rod at the rear of the housing. Our electric drill along with a 3 8 inch bit is used to make the holes. Two 5 16 inch diameter by 1 and 3 quarter inch long bolts with flat washers are used on both sides. Lock washers and nuts are used to secure the brake handle to the support housing. The completed assembly will be attached to our floor liner later. We must reverse the emergency cable mounting brackets before we install our new floor liner. The retaining clips holding the cable to each mounting bracket are pried from the cables. The brackets are then reversed and bolted to the frame mounts on each side with two 5 16 inch diameter by one and a quarter inch long bolts with flat washers, lock washers, and nuts. The cables and clips are reinserted into the reversed mounting brackets and pulled together. Two one-eighth of an inch wire rope clips are used to fasten the cable ends together. At this point, we partially tighten the nuts on the clips. The nuts will be securely tightened after the floor liner is installed and the cable is properly adjusted. We've obtained some rubber matting used for stairway tread from our local home center. We cut the matting into appropriate lengths and widths so that we can apply it to the surfaces of all frame members that will come into contact with the floor liner. 
This will prevent any squeaks and rattles. 3M's 1300 rubber adhesive in a convenient tube is used to cement the matting to the chassis. The floor liner can now be placed on our frame. We simply slide the liner in from the rear, lifting it upward to clear the brake pedal. The speedometer cable is passed through the hole in the front of the floor, and the floor liner is pushed down flush with the frame. When necessary, we stand on the floor using our own weight to push it all the way down. We place the emergency brake lever support housing into the hole we have made in our floor liner. The front of the floor is secured to the firewall with six quarter inch bolts with flat washers, lock washers and nuts. We place our shift lever in the front cutout and bolt it to the floor liner. Following the details in the instruction manual, we use our electric drill with a quarter inch bit and drill holes through the emergency brake lever support housing and floor liner. Then we drill the perimeter holes through the liner and top of the frame members. After this has been completed, we attach the floor to the chassis with 5 16 inch by 1 inch hex or round head self-tapping screws with flat washers underneath the head. We use window weld by 3M or silicone to seal the joint between the floor liner and firewall. Now we can mount our accelerator pedal to the firewall. Two quarter inch diameter by one and a quarter inch long bolts are used and tightened with the appropriate tools. Later, when we fit our seats, we may want to alter the pedal position slightly for comfort or driver preference. This is easily accomplished. We then thread the accelerator cable through the hole in the firewall and clip the retainer in place against the firewall. The cable is slipped through the slot in the accelerator pedal and retained with the plastic clip. If necessary, we tie a knot at the end of the cable to take up any slack. The assembly is tested to make certain that it moves freely. Our chassis is just about complete. We center the battery box, allowing it to overhang an equal amount on each side of the chassis. We may need to trim the sides slightly when we install the body. We will secure the battery box with self-tapping screws prior to mounting it. Our battery can now be installed and connected. A few electrical connections in the engine compartment will allow us to start the engine. Our floor jack is placed at the rear, under the center of the differential. We remove the jack stands and slowly lower our chassis to the floor. For the time being, the original Chevette tires and wheels are retained. We lower the front in the same manner. Our completed chassis is now on the ground. At this point, our chassis is ready for the new Mercedes SSK body we are assembling. It will slip right on the new chassis. Before running our new vehicle, we will remember to recheck everything and torque all necessary bolts to original factory specifications. We will also have the car thoroughly inspected, the front end aligned, and make any other necessary adjustments to meet all safety and emission requirements and standards before the car is driven. It's now time to congratulate ourselves on a job well done.